Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Nathan Leslie. I'm the series editor for Best Small Fictions. And thank you so much for coming to this, which is our last reading for Best Small Fictions, our fifth, our fifth reading. And this particular reading uh, features a number of great authors. And we have a little bit of a sidebar of, um, or a, a theme motif, whatever you want to call it, of um, authors from the DMV. This is a, this is kind of like a, a reading where worlds collide because um, not only is this a best small fictions reading, but it's also a Reston's reading. Um, just one quick note about Reston's readings. Um, th that is the reading series I locally um, started in 2016. And, you know, before the pandemic, we would meet on a monthly basis at the Reston News Bookshop in Reston, Virginia, and, um, you know, have typical in-person readings. But because of the pandemic, obviously, we've... Um, transition to Zoom, and this is a great chance to kind of bring the two worlds together, Best Small Fictions readers with um, the rest of the reading folks as well. So what I'm going to do is um, introduce each author and then allow the authors to um, to read their work. And um, if because we have a, a little bit of a smaller number this evening of, of um, authors reading, we have eight. Um, if authors care to um, talk about inspirations behind the piece, or maybe read something else short, um, that's totally fine. All right. Um, but that's the basic flow of it. And we're going to go in alphabetical order from the authors who are, are here. Um, so first up, um, we have Talia Block. Um, Talia Block is the author of Inheritance, a collection of poems uh, published by Gold Wake Press. Recent poems have appeared in Copper Nickel, Pleiades, and Prairie Schooner. Her essays and feature stories have been published in places such as the Brooklyn Rail, the Forward, and Tablet. So please welcome Talia Block. Hi. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yes. OK. So thank you, Nathan. And um, also thank you to Nathan and Elena Stieler and my, uh, Michelle Levy for including me in this beautiful collection. And uh, also thanks to the Southern Review and Jessica Faust for, for nominating me to be in it. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, the piece included in this book is a prose poem called Growing Up. I will read that first. And as Nathan suggested, I will um, add a, a second uh, short piece. Uh, afterwards, which is a poem of mine that appeared uh, this fall in the North American Review and which shares a great deal with the first poem. So. Growing up. On my father's desk sat a photograph, passport size, cracked and yellowed with age, tucked into the corner of a large frame. A boy's small face with round cheeks and large eyes peered out from it as I sat bent over my math homework, struggling through the numbers. The boy and my father had been friends back then in the old country. They rode the tram together to school until one night it was burned to ash and glass and they were forced to go to a different school. Such a picky eater, my grandmother used to say about the boy. His mother had so much trouble with him. I made him spaghetti when he came to play, but even that he ate plain. In the large frame was also a larger photograph of an old man sitting on a park bench in Upper Manhattan wearing a cap and holding a cane. It was my grandfather smiling at my father, now grown, holding the camera. When they left for America, my father was still a boy. There were three passports, one for my father, one for my grandfather, and one for my grandmother. For five days, they took a boat across the ocean. In America, they all lived in one room, but ate well. 
Passport sighs, but the boy's passport never came. So he stayed on as the burning spread and the ashes piled up to the skies. The murmurs of the murdered grew uncountable. Even cheese and sauce he refused, said my grandmother. Most nights I did my homework by the boy's photograph, thinking that he had died because he wouldn't eat. So that's the first poem. And this is the second one, it's called Laundry Day. Laundry Day. Where will the refugees wash their clothes, he said. With no water, only a bundle each and snow on the way. We were in the laundromat, half watching the dryers spin their mini globes, half watching the TV mounted high on the wall as it dampened the air with news. 39 drowned at sea today, said the anchor, capsized by the wind. Hundreds more have arrived on foot at the camp near the border. A stream of faces, brightly colored coats and scarves cut gullies into the landscape. Then a young man stopped to stand by a family, swept the ground with his shoe and lowered his boy to sit as the cameras looked on. Their sheets would make great tents, I said, white and stiff like sails. Someone shouted off screen, then we heard a dog. The buzzer sounded, you pulled our sheets from the machine as a warm scent filled the air and the January night lowered itself to the street outside. Where are they, you said, as you surveyed our bags, calculating how to carry them all home. I don't know, I said. Someone had strung up a clothesline by his tent, a few shirts strained in the wind, like flags of an unnamed country. And in the background, more tents, more people, and an orange vest. A snow began to fall, streaking the camera's lens with tiny hands. Thank you. That was wonderful. And thank you so much for reading that second piece too, Talia. Thank you. I love reading the, uh, the comments on the, on the chat. <laughs> so feel free to, to throw your comments up there. I love that. It's not a, I don't view that as, um, I guess some people view that as, you know, like uh, an interruption, but I, I think it's great. It's a nice sidebar. Um, okay, so next up we have uh, Thoughts on Raising Girls Freshly Feral by Samantha Edmonds. Uh, Samantha is the author of the chat books, Pretty to Think So, uh, and The Space Poet. Her fiction and nonfiction has appeared in the New York Times, Ninth Letter, Michigan Quarterly Review, The Rumpus, and McSweeney's Internet Tendency, among others, a PhD student in creative writing at the University of Missouri. She currently lives in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, please visit her online at uh, samanthaedmonds.com. Please welcome Samantha Edmonds. Hi, thank you so much um, for the introduction and for having me. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. Uh, with all of you um, and to be reading alongside so many wonderful writers. So I'll just read um, my piece from uh, Hayden's very review and then later in Best Mall Fiction. So this is exciting. Thoughts on raising girls freshly feral. These are children of the wood. They know how to stand on four legs, a shoulders width apart on a mountainside and bellow bear like. Some girls leap mad as squirrels, loud and wild. Others stalk silent through sticks and bark, arm hair raised like fox hackles. Yet more girls bound after deer through yellow grass, faster on four legs than adult men are on two. 
Others grip tree limbs and horn toughened toes and cackle scream. They jump so surely through the air you will swear they are flying. They are a tangle, a tumble of grass painted skeletons wearing crowns of leaves in their hair and a kingdom of branches. Your job is to bring the girls home, teach them. When you arrive in their forest, booted feet covered in mud, baseball cap on head, hair sticking to the back of your neck and flies too, the girls scream and flap skinny arms. Or they snarl and crouch on hands and knees, hunkered necks low. Or they rear on two legs and paw the air and blow through the nose, slap the ground with open palms. The men who led you here are dirty, experienced, unafraid. They look at their quarry and smile, clap each other back on the back and say, we're losing the light, be easier to round them up in the morning. They build a fire and you sit near it, so close that your cheeks and calves start to burn. The forest is full of their night noises, howling, snuffling, shaking tree branches. You scoot closer to the fire, even though the embers spark on your knees. The men sleep, you don't. You never close your eyes, not ever, in the dark around strange men. In one boot, you have stuck a can of mace, in the other, a pocket knife. Still, you stick close to the light. Your red nails are black from the dirt. Your cell phone doesn't work out here. You want to check your voicemail for a new message from your doctor, anxious to be unreachable, but glad too. In the morning, the sleeping men will help you bring the children, the girls, to the city. To capture them, the men will have to get close to them even though they stamp and stomp and scream and snarl. The men will come close and the men will touch them though they do not want to be touched. And the men will put them in nets and cages and you will take them home where you've been hired by an adoption company to teach them girlhood things. You usually teach addition, subtraction, picture books like a house for hermit crab. But you need the money, you rationalize, remembering the voicemail you hope isn't there. These girls do not need math. They need you to teach them many things but not, <clears throat> excuse me, they need, these girls do not need math. You need the practice raising unwanted children. Start by teaching them how to be afraid of the dark. They are not yet, not like you have learned to be after years of using the bathroom in a group, never leaving your drink unattended at a party, locking your car doors in a late night drive through Not them, they are raised by and have become creatures of the dark woods, hunters at home in the night, equipped with claws, a sense of their own capability, teeth that they do not use for smiling. Like you, they have had their survival depend on their awareness, scuttling through the trees. But unlike you, they are alert and not afraid, unless you teach them to be, like you were taught. No one knows for sure how they got there in this tall national park a few hours from the state line, but you think you know. You can imagine the panic of new mothers holding daughters for the first time, thinking about everything this baby must unlearn to be a woman. How tempting it would be to never teach them, to instead leave them and leave them touched, except to sleep nose to tail with a fox, to lose oneself in the thick mat of bear fur, to pick insects from feathered backs. They will know the feel of soft moss under fingertips and what it is like to walk through the night and not be frightened of men. This way they are more rocks and branches and sharp edges than girls. A mother might wonder if it is necessary to teach them to shrink, to shy, to shake. Surely not these girls, they of the forest caves and cliffs and cold rivers and prickly brush. Perhaps as you wait, you may start to wonder if you too should leave them, join them even, right where they are. Uh, thank you so much. I'm just gonna read the one piece today. That was really wonderful, Samantha. Thank you so much. I love the point of view and the tumble of sentences in that piece. Okay, next up we have Kellyanne Jacobson, who is going to read uh, Seashells from Gargoyle. And um, Kellyanne Jacobson is the author or editor of many published books, including novels such as Cario, uh, sorry, Cairo and, and White, the poetry collection, I Have Conversations With You in My Dreams, 
and anthologies such as Dear Robot, an anthology of epistolary science fiction. She also writes young adult speculative novels under her pen name, Annabelle J. Kelly is a PhD candidate in fiction at Florida State University and teaches speculative fiction for Southern New Hampshire um, University's online MFA in creative writing. Her work can be found at kellyannjacobson.com. Please welcome Kelly Ann Jacobson. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to be reading my one piece that was originally published in Gargoyle. Oh, and I did uh, successfully defend this week, so I can be Dr. Jacobson now, which is very exciting. <laughs> yeah, as of Wednesday, so that was my big achievement of the week. Um, I'm just going to read the one piece. It's funny because I wrote this piece before I actually had kids. Kids are featured heavily, as you'll see, but I didn't have kids at the time. So it's definitely taken on new meaning as I have a toddler and a 10-month-old. And then also now that COVID has happened, um, taken on even more meaning. So I'll just say that before I I read. Seashells. When the woman at the door offered to turn my children into seashells for $100, I didn't hesitate. She'd originally come with three pieces of travel luggage, all black with pale pink trim and stocked with Mary Kay products and discount coupons, in order to persuade me to throw a makeover party. I knew that's what she would say, even though she hadn't gotten the words out, because someone from Mary Kay came by almost every month. Maybe it was Mrs. Perkins' yard flamingos. These women seem drawn to all things pink. This particular woman, whose name was Stella, wore a pink tweed suit, even though it was mid-July, and smelled like all of the makeup counters at the mall rolled into one. Hi, my name is Stella. For smile. I'm a consultant for Mary Kay, and I've been... She hadn't even gotten through her elevator pitch. Susie, who'd been strapped into her high chair the last time I'd seen her, had somehow gotten loose and found her way to the door. She had half of a banana clutched in her triumphant fist, and when Stella bent down to coo at little Susie, the girl thrust that banana right into Stella's chest. Oh, Stella said, and her face got red. She didn't complain, though, probably thought I'd make a pity purchase, and Susie frowned at the lack of response. Stella picked banana pieces from her suit and tossed them on the doorstep, where the yellow mush looked like splattered bodies. Billy chose this moment to fly his new remote-controlled helicopter through the door. Perhaps he hadn't realized we had company, but more likely navigating the helicopter right into Stella's perky face was his plan all along. Sorry, he yelled from behind me as Stella swatted at the helicopter like it was a large fly in her kitchen. Her hair, previously a blonde helmet, had become more of a blonde halo after her violent swings had caused it to frizz and flip outward. Still, the children might have gotten away with it all, but then Susie had done the unthinkable, something a little girl her age shouldn't have been capable of. We'd been so busy with the helicopter that we hadn't noticed Susie zipping and unzipping the makeup case, and by the time we realized it, my girl had twisted several tubes of lipstick and then used them as chalk to draw on the sidewalk. Not just anything, mind you, a certain part of the female anatomy. Susie! I picked her up and set her down behind me, from which point she tottered off to do more damage around the house while I wasn't looking. Your children, Stella said through gasps after Susie and Billy had finally retreated. They're horrible! I should have disagreed, but I couldn't. They were objectively horrible. Listen, Stella leaned in and the lines of her makeup came into focus. I shouldn't do this, but I'm willing to make a deal. If you give me $100, I'll turn your children into seashells. Seashells? For some reason, this was the part that confused me. Why seashells? Think about it. Most objects don't make any noise, but a seashell? It sings. Once I turn your children into seashells, you'll be able to hear them whenever you press the shell to your ear. I didn't ask any follow-up questions. Instead, I handed over $100 and waited expectantly. The house went still, and I knew even before I turned around that there would be no one behind me. Here you go. Stella handed me two shells. That coffee bean is little Susie, and the scotch bonnet is Billy. Careful now. I took my children in my hands and held them to my ears. Sure enough, their voices started almost immediately, but they weren't singing. They were screaming. Their voices together were like a chainsaw and a weed whacker battling on a Saturday morning. Ugh, I pulled the shells away. What's all that racket? Stella shrugged. She had packed her bags, including the used lipstick tubes, and was ready to be on her way. I can't work miracles, she said before turning around. Anyway, if you ever want to throw a makeover party, I didn't hear the rest. I'd closed the front door, and the silence of the place had sent a shiver through my body. A shiver of anticipation and anxiety, but most of all, excitement. Life was going to be different. Now my husband and I split our time between Texas and Oahu. We wear matching hiking sandals and flowery shirts, and every night we drink mojitos on the back porch while listening to Simon and Garfunkel. Life is good. 
On the rare occasion when the house feels too quiet or the guilt pecks away at me like a bird out of feeder, we listen to Susie and Billy scream their terrible songs. Most of the time, we leave them on the bathroom shelf where they belong. Thank you. <laughs> I always feel weird that I'm the only one clapping, but everyone else is clapping. You just can't hear them. <laughs> Kelly, that was great. Thank you so much for reading that piece. And, uh, you know, it's a nice, um, it, it's a nice change of pace from some of the darker pieces too. It's nice to not just have death and despair in every single piece, <laughs> which is sort of like yeah, where my editorial aesthetic might, might, uh, sometimes lead me. Um, Okay, um, next up we have Kara Oakleaf, who will tell us about the mermaids who grow old from Pithead Chapel. And uh, I'll tell you about Kara. Uh, Kara Oakleaf's work has appeared in Smoke Long Quarterly, Wigleaf, um, Matchbook, Booth, Jellyfish Review, Monkey Bicycle, Nimrod, Pithead, Chap sorry, Pithead Chapel, and others. Um, her fiction has been listed in the Wigleaf Top 50 and also appears in the Bloomsbury Anthology Short Form Creative Writing. She, re she received her MFA at George Mason University, where she now teaches writing and literature and directs the Fall for the Book Literary Festival. Find more of her work at karaoakleaf.com. Please welcome Kara Oakleaf. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be reading with um, all of these wonderful writers. And um, thanks again to you and, uh, and Elena for selecting this piece for, for the anthology this year. Okay, um, This is The Mermaids Grow Old. It must have happened to our mothers and their mothers before them, but still it stunned us when we first noticed the wisps of hair at our temples going gray. We looked around and called for our mothers, wanting to ask them a question, but found ourselves alone. The sailors never tell these stories. To them, we are only glimpses of some fantastic mystery, all youth and beauty. For a time, we must have believed them. We hope our daughters will see our kind as something more than the myths humans build up around us. What are they to us anyway, we ask them, these men who scoop up the ocean in their ropes, dragging whole, fish, whole schools of fish out of the water for food. We once thought we could keep our daughters from them, fearful as they were when they first saw a family of mackerel snatched up and drawn to the surface. But they learned the stories. They know the way sailors seek us out, not to catch us, but just to gaze. They feel the tug of that power, like a current. We recall our own youth, remind ourselves of the first time we saw our wooden likeness carved into a ship, the fins at the prow grazing the water and parting the ocean for them. No wonder the young ones watch this and feel strong enough to chase ships, arching out of the water like they might take flight, airborne just long enough for the men to see a flicker of them before the splash. We must admit that we too once found them fascinating, the, these men on those great hulks floating at the surface. We rose from the oceans at night and saw the lights of ships at rest, the portholes glowing like a row of suns. In the dark, we could get close, peer inside and see them in the candlelight. We watched them at their bolted tables, drinking mugs of froth and foam and in their beds of rope strung from the walls, so similar to the nets they used to draw fish, to draw fish from the water during the day. If there were women, we watched them too. Maybe in the same way men tell stories about us, we ascribed something special to the women. We saw them so rarely they might've been mirages. But then we tell our daughters, we saw what the men did to them. Once, we've seen, once we've, they've seen it enough, we re, <clears throat> once they've seen it enough, we reassure each other, they'll stop going to the surface. It's not that we're afraid of them. They won't have our daughters. We know they'll never split us down the middle the way they do with their women. In the water where everything floats, we never have to lie down, and this too is a kind of power. But for us, the allure of open air is gone, and what sailors would want to see us now anyway? Our hair is still long, but the color of a dank storm sky, our skin ghostly pale. Even our breasts have shriveled and show wrinkles, and we've begun to wonder why we ever needed these cracked open clamshells to conceal them in the first place. If we dress at all anymore, we prefer to wrap ourselves in swaths of seaweed, covering our stomachs where the skin goes soft and spills open and spills over that secret spot at our hips where we fade into scales. These days, we gather at the bottom of the sea, away from our daughters. 
We watch the movement of the ocean floor and we know where to go when our time is over so that the water will quickly, quickly pull the sand across our bodies. The younger ones won't come this way, enamored as they are with the surface, and they too will be surprised when it happens to them. Perhaps it still surprises us. Sometimes we still look beautiful in this ethereal light, our hair floating in slow motion like a fog. From certain angles, a sailor might even believe that these gray hairs are strands of silver, shimmering like something precious. There's no chance of being spotted in these depths, but some nights we wonder what the sailors would say about us now. Would they understand us? Would they feel compassion if they saw that we too are mortal? Or would they turn cold and bitter if they saw that even the creatures of imagination might grow old and wither? We have spent too many of our thoughts on these men. This is what we tell the young ones as they flit across the sea, stirring up so much sand as they chase the ships. Still, we let them go, watch them from below as they flash themselves like tricks of light at the surface, their scales mirroring the sunlight. We haven't forgotten that wooden mermaid at the prow, how she looked like she was flying when she cut the water with the tips of her fin, head high in the open air. The carved swirl of her hair, thick as rope, the scales notched carefully along her body. How solid she looked. Far below the surface, we'll shroud ourselves in seaweed. When it's over, the smallest fish will nibble our skin and fins down to their delicate bones, and there will be nothing left to prove we ever grew old. We'll be another piece of the ocean, the seabed shifting to cover our remains. And if any of our scales surface and catch the faint light that finds its way to the bottom, they'll only look like the glint of a sunken coin, a lost bit of treasure from some other sailor's story, something extraordinary and just as unbelievable. Thanks. Love that. Great piece. Thank you so much, Kara. And um, also, uh, I, I mentioned when I was introducing Kara that she uh, she uh, runs the Fall for the Book Literary Festival. So um, if you are in the DC area, um, check that out. I mean, I can't imagine how much, uh, how, how large of a job that must be, Kara, to to do that. I mean, it must be just a huge undertaking. It's, it's always a great um, event and festival. Okay, next up we have uh, Curtis Smith, who will read his piece, The Kitchen from Atticus Review. And uh, Curtis Smith's 13th book, The Magpie's Return, was published this past summer by Running Wild. He lives and works in Pennsylvania. Please welcome Curtis Smith. Thank you, Nathan. Um, and thank you, everyone. It's nice to, to see everyone after reading you know, your work in, in this book. I, I've really enjoyed it and I'm honored um, to be part of it. Um, the story is only like two paragraphs long, but it's, I think it encapsulates a lot of the themes I'm kind of, I gravitate toward of uh, poverty and, and, and violence and, and you know, forgiveness. So um, here we go. The kitchen. The son cooks for his father the old man's trailer, yellowed windows, flies caught on dangling strips. The sun prepares meals for the week. The old man smokes and pages through the magazines the sun has brought. The old man looks at the pictures, reads a caption or two, turns the page. The sun makes shepherd's pie and chili. Last week, turkey soup. A single meal eaten together the rest refrigerated. As they eat, one of them will break the silence and share a memory, a house they rented along the railroad tracks, the locomotive's shaking of windows and dishes, a creek where they fished for steelheads and walleyes, the late summer's flow speckled with milkweed seeds, a mutt named Bo. The other man smiles, yes, I remember, the son has forgiven his father for his drinking, forgiven him for a childhood of chaos. This, to the son, is a miracle, a revelation born from last fall's hospital visit. The father wrinkled and broken, tubes to bring him oxygen and to take his urine. The body the boy had once feared now shriveled beneath an ill-fitting gown. The son's forgiveness unplanned, a reflex, and when the weight lifted, he was stunned by the lightness of his body. 
In the space where he'd once nurtured his hate, there was now not love, but an emptiness the son understood would be his to fill or ignore. Later that evening, the son cooks with his daughter. On his clothes, the scent of his father's cigarettes. The little girl on a chair, a spatula in hand, and an apron that reaches her ankles. The countertop a mess, but he doesn't scold her for the eggs she breaks or the flour she spills. Their kitchen's so different, the sunlight and good smells. The girl talks and he listens to it all, asking questions, feigning surprise. He won't let his daughter see her grandfather, but he brings pictures to the old man and tells him stories. The girl's fascination with creekside frogs, the cat she dresses in doll's clothes. The old man smiles. This is so new for all of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Curtis. That was great. Are you sure you don't want to read something else? That was so short. Uh, no, I'm not prepared for something else, okay. but thank you though. Okay, no problem. That was great. Thank you. I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm always so curious to hear um, what inspired uh, what inspired people's work. I guess that's just the author and me and the editor. I mean, both are sort of battling out in my head, in my head as I'm, as I'm listening to these great pieces of, you know, how you, how you conceived of the piece, how you, um, were initially inspired, um, I, to all the authors. Um, so anyway, that's just my own curiosity. Okay, next up we have Amber Sparks, who is going to read um, Everything is Terrible, but you should read this story, <laughs> which I think pretty much sums it all up for the past, you know, 12 months. Um, Amber Sparks is the author of several short story collections, including the most recent, I Do Not Forgive You. She also has written essays and short fiction published widely in places like uh, New York Magazine, uh, Granta, Tin House, and the Paris Review. Um, you can find her most days on Twitter at Amber Noel. Please welcome Amber Sparks. Hi. <laughs> um, so, oh gosh, sorry. It's, I, I have like this um, rather terrible connection. I apologize. Um, so hopefully you can sort of kind of see me. <laughs> At least you can hear me, which is good. Um, so um, I'm going to read uh, Everything is Terrible. And it's kind of funny because, um, you know, the piece, I, I initially wrote the piece, uh, you know, um, a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it was in 2017. So, um, or 20, 2018, maybe, um, that I wrote it. So, um, although it wasn't published in Smoke Long Quarterly until um, last year. Uh, so it actually predates the current terrible <laughs> period that we find ourselves in um, and was and was, you know, in large part a response to um, Trump being um, elected and me too and some of the other things that were happening. I'm going to turn my light on and see if that helps. Um, that's at least maybe a tiny bit better. Um, and so, um, yeah, this is so this is sort of a response to that. And it's also um, uh, I was really, really excited to have it included in the anthology um, for the obvious honor of having it included, but also because um, uh, it's a story told in second person. And, um, you know, I love second person stories. Uh, people feel very strongly about them. A lot of people hate them uh, and bash them a lot online um, and uh, in various places. And uh, I always feel... Um, very annoyed about that because I feel like, uh, first of all, I just, I think they can be great, um, as great as any other point of view. Uh, but I also, um, I also have feel like they are oftentimes, um, responses to trauma in a lot of ways. Um, you, because you're sort of one step removed from your own trauma and it makes it a little easier to write that. Uh, so Anyway, um, I, I think that they can be very um, beautiful and, and useful stories in a lot of ways. Uh, so I'm really grateful that this one um, 
was included and I get to read it tonight. So let me find it here, okay. Everything is terrible, but you should read this story. This is a story born of need. It's the story you need right now. This is the story of a mother and a daughter in which the mother doesn't, doesn't disappear, doesn't peace out, doesn't die. This is a story where the mother stays. It's the story your mother told you when you were small, the one where Tiresias was struck blind when he saw his mother bathing with Athena, but the goddess instead granted him visions of the future. It's the story where your mother whispered, we'll have such secrets together and you felt loved instead of frightened. It's the story in which you were proud of the stories your mother told you, in which you never begged your mother to just please tell you the same fairy tales that every other kid's mother told them. It's the story where your mother became a classicist because she was fascinated by mythology and not because the story of Philomela resonated with her so deeply. In this story, your mother never lost her tongue. It's the story in which, in the 10th grade, when you asked your boyfriend, do you think I'm odd? Instead of his laughing and saying no, putting out the long white flame of strangeness you'd kept protected since you were old enough to understand yourself, instead he said yes. In this story, he said, yes, yes, you are odd. And the flame whooshed up and burned your old life quick and clean as paper and left you new, shining, phoenix feathered. It's the story where your parents divorced when you were little, not a teenager. And when you asked your mother, what are you thinking of? She didn't say dying. No, in this story, she says flying. And in this story, she told you how wings work. In this story, Icarus sealed his wings with something stronger than wax and he sailed right up into the sun until Apollo plucked him out and praised him. Here, Apollo is the good father Icarus never had. In this story, red means nothing. In this story, rope is for climbing, not falling. Here, there are no signifiers, no associations, as if everything were happening for the first time, as if sensations were like the closed cells of monks and gardenia perfume didn't smell like anything but gardenias. It is not that there is no sadness in this story. Stories need conflict and crying can be dreamy, but sadness like ships must be steered. And this story doesn't come from a need for catharsis. There are no iced over ponds, no wooden wheels stuck in the metaphorical mud. There are no bodies hanging from a ceiling fan. This story doesn't turn into a horror movie when people ask or tell you that you're just like your mother. In this story, the secret staircase to Hades is in your bedroom closet and you can descend whenever you like as many times as you need to keep on saving your mother. In this story, you take a sack of barley bread soaked in honey for Cerberus, just like she taught you. You bring her back again and again. You give her time for her hair to go from indigo to white. You skirt the hangman's knot. In this story, everyone is safe. This story comes with a guarantee of safety. In this story, you aren't afraid to have children. In this story, when women are attacked, they grow armor like a sudden carapace. They grow an extra tongue so they can sound their attacker's name forever while also singing karaoke, while talking to friends, while eating pizza at a restaurant they are not afraid to walk home from. This is a story where women are alone all the time at bars and on hiking trails and in quiet suburban neighborhoods and on chattering city streets and nobody dreams of fucking with them because so many women have extra tongues these days. This is a story where bad men reap what they have sown. In this story, someone else is president. And now he is. In this story, nobody drops down into themselves and drowns after their boyfriend rapes them. In this story, nobody finds out, returning home for comfort, that their mother too was once raped. In fact, in this story, there is no rape. We all need a story without rape right now. In this story, there is no such thing as social media. Just kidding, this story can only fix so much and the rest is up to you, you, your followers, and the ones you call friends. 
But in this story, the dreadful people are all banned for life though. In this story, there are colorful birds, warm milk, candy hearts, strange cats, good dogs, stars, friends, moon landings, mothers, wildflowers, video games, and kindness. It's an old fashioned story, this one. Kindness flows through it like a lazy river rafted by every character. It nourishes everyone. It's a slow story, the kind of slowness that allows the reader to settle in, to eat well, to be unafraid, to learn what kind of story this will be over time. This is a story where your mother still tucks you in at night, metaphorically or literally your choice. There are no weapons in this story. There might be razors, yes, but only the sort you need to cut out the bad parts and leave the good bits, the bits that will save your life. Thank you. That was terrific. Um, also, I love the repetition in that piece. Not only do you have the second person going on, but you also have that, uh, that rhythmic repetition. Um, which is really, you know, an incantation in that particular piece. Thank you so much for reading that. Okay, uh, next up we have Josh, uh, Josh Weiner, uh, who is gonna tell us about Human Being, um, uh, published in Body Literature. Uh, Josh Weiner is the author of three books of poetry, most recently, The Figure of a Man Being Swallowed by a Fish, is also the editor of At the Barriers on the poetry of Tom Gunn, all from Chicago. Um, his Berlin notebook reporting about the refugee crisis in Germany was published by Los Angeles Review of Books in 2016 as a digital edition and supported with a Guggenheim Fellowship. A chapbook, um, Trump Poems, is a free digital edition from Dispatches, um, also published is a translation of uh, Nellie Sachs's uh, Flight and Metamorphosis will be published uh, this year in, uh, by um, FSG. Please welcome Josh Weiner. Thank you. Um, uh, it's, it's great to be included. I'm not often included in um, a, a gathering of fiction. And so um, I, I, I appreciate uh, being a part of this. Uh, the inspiration, uh, um, I don't know, uh, I, I feel that um, we largely remain uh, mysterious to each other. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, the mystery of each other uh, reaches out and, and touches us when we're in each other's presence, um, often by surprise. This is called Human Being. Along the perimeter of a busy compound on a sidewalk in front of a high black iron fence, two women are standing in a drizzle without umbrellas. Early fall before trees turn with the stubborn warmth of summer holding off cooler weather. They are facing each other, one with head bowed, reading something to herself on her cell phone the other watching her read. Tiny pearls of water collect on strands of hair. Slowly, the reading woman's face starts to change. The lips, starting at the center, slowly curl in a tight grimace. The brows bear down. Cheek muscles push, reducing the eyes to slits. The whole face for a flash resists collapsing into unbelieving grief, then collapses. The reading woman's eyes stay trained on the words. She keeps reading through first tears, her shoulders shivering slightly, the tension of a lake troubled by growing wind. The other woman speaks her body strong in readiness to lean in to comfort, but something holds her back. The shock of impact, what the reading one is reading, 
an unexpected blow keeps the other woman pushed outside of it. She's not allowed in. Even in public, the reading one's first intimacy is with herself. She must meet herself as in a grove of thorns. She must stand there still in a silent settling of lengthening night, green thicket beginning to redden. To welcome in the other, she needs first to add time. You can see that it's already quickly reforming, finding new direction, grief shifting to mourning. Only then does she somehow signal to the other woman, she can come in now, permission is granted. An inviolable public privacy has been turned inside out like a shirt that one is still wearing. The other woman takes a step towards her. A first tentative hand on a shoulder gives way to an embrace. They are together, finally, in each other's arms. New lovers, joined by the need to be consoled, the need to console. Seconds go by, then a day, then years. In space, opens between them, even as they stay touching. And um, I thought I would just read one more uh, short piece. Sure. Um, uh, this, is, this is new and hasn't shown up anywhere. Uh, it's um, a, a, another short piece in prose uh, that's dedicated to the memory of uh, the poet Stanley Plumley. It's called To a Near Degree. To a Near Degree. I was perched in a typical cafe chair, an iron frame and hard seat encouraging me to finish and move on. He was comfortably caught in a couch that enveloped him like a carnivorous flower. He was telling me something important about the internal I and the passion to unify, that moment in which memory is alive with the present tense. We seemed to be approaching a silence but couldn't quite get there, so continued talking. What he is really saying here, he said, and then the word science tripped me up and I lost myself in the brightly colored bottles lined up at the back of the bar. After a while, the word violence brought me back. Now it was about the fact of things and it felt like I wasn't getting it all, as if underlining existence with a felt tip pen to find the place again later. The application is the point, he said. The point of the pen? The hardest thing, I said, is not putting yourself on that you did something or are doing it. He scooped some milky foam from his lukewarm coffee and lifted it halfway to his mouth. That's not the hardest thing, he said. I waited for him to put the spoon in his mouth. Outside, a line of six musicians passed by, not playing their instruments, but that still made small sounds against belt buckles and wedding rings. Someone called out from across the street. So we were in Italy, I knew it. Was it Luca? He was getting up, breaking the gravitational grip of the couch, and he moved past me. I guess I was getting the check. Exiting the cafe, he turned left. Following him out at some distance, I turned right and climbed stone stairs winding steeply up a hill. The sun was high and it was like the air wanted to have sex with you. Looking down, I could see him slowly make his way along the street stopping to say hello to someone, a man waiting with an old style hat, a fedora 
a word I learned reading Dashiell Hammett. A woman at a fruit stand buying grapes ignored him. I could see that he had a newspaper tucked under his arm. Did he have that in the cafe? High clouds gave a chuckle like a quilt in the throat. He was taking his time. Josh, that was great. Thank you so much for reading both pieces. Wonderfully read. And uh, as an alum of uh, University of Maryland, um, that piece, that second piece really hits home for me. I was there when Stanley Plumley was teaching. Um, I apologize, we missed one author, uh, Amy Stuber, who will finish this off here. Um, Amy's going to share only a little bit less than I hate myself out of alphabetical order. <laughs> um, here's a little bit about Amy. Uh, and, oh, by the way, this was published in Longleaf Review. Amy Stuber's fiction has appeared in Copper Nickel, New England Review, Smoke Long Quarterly, Wigleaf, and elsewhere. She's the print editor for uh, Split Lip Magazine and is on Twitter as well. Please welcome Amy Stuber. Still there, Amy? Oh, there you are. I think you're muted. Maybe you try the volume on your computer. Mm. Oh, well, sorry about that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, well, maybe next time. Okay. Okay, um, well, I wanted to uh, thank everyone for reading and uh, thank you all for coming to the reading as well and listening to all these great pieces. I mean, you know, there was a lot of really wonderful um, literature. I think one, you know, re uh, read this evening. And, um, you know, if you wanna, if you feel like hanging out for a few minutes and chatting um, about, you know, literature, about writing and whatever, uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, However, uh, at this point, if, if you just wanna call it a night, that's fine as well. Um, thank you all so much, especially to the readers for sharing their work. And again, um, Best Small Fictions 2020, I think it's a really remarkable anthology. Um, check it out if, uh, if you're not in it already, and don't already have a copy. Um, and you know, enjoy your, the rest of your, of your Sunday. And um, thanks again so much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. This is one of the first like reading events I've done in like years. <laughs> so it's like I had a baby. It's been crazy. So it's been really nice. I did great. I mean, you know, your reading was really terrific. <laughs> Thank it's you. I too. enjoy it. Like actually getting to talk to people. <laughs> A sliver of the real world. <laughs> I know, but it was weird reading it. I was like, oh, this rings different now. <laughs> like, I don't know about this. It's so, we're all feeling a little like that now, I think in a very specific way. Yeah, it's great. 
been wonderful. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Nathan. Sarah. Thanks, Talia. It was great. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Kara. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah. Thanks, Curtis. Take care. You too. Um, Eric, uh, can I give you my email? And I can do it. That's my dad. So I can oh, send okay. you each other's email. I was like, yeah, dad, he's like oh, really so good with technology. Awesome. Thank goodness. <laughs> of course, I guess I could always. You're, you're still recording. Yeah.